By the end of this tutorial, you'll know the basics of using generative design in Fusion 360. If you haven't heard, this week at Autodesk University, they announced that everyone with one of the new license types can use the generative design tool for free until the end of this year. If you've migrated to the new personal use license type, then you should now see the generative design option in the workspace dropdown list. Normally, using generative design would require the use of cloud credits to run the studies. However, until January 1st, 2020, they're making it free for everyone and running studies does not require any paid cloud credits. So this is the perfect time to play around with generative design, even if you don't need it for any current projects. If you think Autodesk should extend the free use further into 2020, then comment yes down below in the comments. To get started, I want to spend the first minute or so to give you a basic overview of generative design. To start, I should clarify that generative design is not something unique to Fusion 360. Many other CAD programs offer an alternative set of features, and there are even a few standalone programs. The basic premise of generative design is that we let the computer generate a large number of ideas in a much quicker fashion than we could ever explore on our own. Every generative design workflow starts by the designer or engineer creating simple shapes as the skeleton or minimum requirements for the part. We then need to define some rules or guidelines such as materials, size, weight, force, manufacturing methods, cost, and so on. The computer program then takes the defined set of rules and our basic model and generates hundreds or even thousands of potential design solutions. From there, we're able to filter and select the outcomes that best meet the needs of our problem. If you do a quick Google search for generative design, you'll see some cool examples in several different industries. Now the transportation industry, particularly the automotive and aerospace segments, have been utilizing generative design to cut down on the number of parts required. We're also starting to see the adoption of generative design in architecture and many other industries. Let's now get started by jumping right into Fusion 360. For this tutorial, I'm going to use one of the sample parts so it's easier for you to follow along and so you can run your first generative design study in about 15 minutes. Within your data panel, you should have a generative design samples folder. If you double click on that, we're given a few different sample parts that we can utilize to learn generative design. I'm going to double click to open the GE bracket. Then you'll see that all the demo files are locked until we create a copy. We'll need to select the file menu and save as so we can start working with a copy of the file. We can now enter the generative design workspace by selecting it from the drop down list. If you don't see that as an option, then make sure that you have the latest version of Fusion 360 and that you've restarted your copy of Fusion within the last few days. You'll also want to make sure you're using the new personal use non-commercial license as the old startup licenses will not have access to generative design as they haven't been upgraded to the new system. Within the generative design workspace, you can see that we have several different tools and features that aren't available elsewhere in Fusion 360. We're also automatically placed in the Define Contextual tab, which is laid out to streamline our workflow. We're going to follow the toolbar from left to right, which will ensure that we follow all the necessary steps required to run a study. However, the very first icon is to toggle open the learning panel, so we can ignore that one for now. The second option is the Study Options. Now when you enter the Generative Design workspace, Fusion 360 will automatically create a new study. If you look in the browser on the left hand side, you'll see that study number one is present. A study is essentially Fusion 360's way of grouping all of the rules and requirements that we define for the program. Therefore, you can create multiple studies per each design file if you're looking to test different ideas. Before we do anything, we just want to double check that our study 1 is currently active. 
we also want to take a look at our study settings from the drop down list. Now, the resolution allows you to specify the desired resolution of the generated designs. We want ours to be somewhere in the middle between coarse and fine. The more accurate the solution, the more time the application will need to complete all of the calculations, so be sure to use the fine setting with caution. Now, I understand that this setting doesn't make much sense just by looking at it alone. However, once we get to the end of this tutorial where we have different solutions generated for us, you'll start to see the resolution of the model. For now, I'll click OK. The next thing that we want to double check before we move any further is our document units. One important thing to note is that the document units you have set in the design workspace are not tied to the generative design workspace. Now this GE part is supposed to be done with inches, so I'll hover over the units option in the browser and I'll select the edit icon. Then from the drop down list, we'll need to select the option US inches before clicking OK. Up until this point, all that we've done is double checked our settings to make sure that our study processes designs with our desired output. We now need to preserve the components that are required for our final shape. In other words, we need to select all of the components of our model that must be incorporated into the final design, or the design would be useless without them. To define them, we'll need to use the Preserve Geometry feature. As I hover over the feature, notice the caster example. This is a great example to help you understand this concept. Our wheel must have an axle, otherwise the final wheel couldn't roll. Therefore, the axle would be one component that needs to be preserved. A caster also needs a way to attach to the object that's getting moved around, so the top cylinder of the caster would also need to be preserved. With this GE part, we have six components that need to be selected. To look at all of our components, we can toggle open the Model Components folder. You'll then see our assembly, which can also be toggled open to show all of the individual components. We need to select the four cylinders that surround the outer post. The order you select them does not matter with this feature. We also need to select these two inner rings. We can hide the pin component to make it easier to select them. Double check in the dialog that all six are selected and then click OK. Notice how the preserved parts are automatically color coded in green. That also correlates to the preserved geometry folder in the browser. Within the design space dropdown, two other features can be activated. The second option is obstacle geometry. Now the obstacle geometry feature is used to define any areas or space where the generated designs cannot take up space. If we look back at our caster example, we would need to select the wheel component as the sidewalls of the caster can't obstruct the wheel or the wheel wouldn't be able to roll. In our design, we need to select the base component and the pin component. This tells the program that our part must not take up the space of either of these two components. After clicking OK, we can look at the other option in the design space dropdown which is the starting shape. Now this feature lets you define a body that should be used as a starting point for all of the generated designs. However, we won't use this option in our design. Note that both this and the obstacle geometry features are optional. Notice how they're also color coded with yellow and red respectively. If you ever want to modify any of these features, then simply select their corresponding edit icon in the browser. You can then select additional bodies or deselect bodies as necessary. At this point, we've started to define how the computer should process our model. Let's continue defining our rules by adding some structural constraints. Structural constraints help the program know which parts of the object cannot be moved. Ultimately, defining these will help make the generated outcomes a more realistic solution. I'll activate the Structural Constraints feature, and I'll make sure the default Fixed option is selected. With our GE part, you can see in the browser that these four outer cylinders are all created under the component name of Fixed Constraints. 
This sample file is simply letting us know which ones should be fixed. We'll need to select all four and notice how the lock icon appears to let us know that we have a fixed constraint on them. After clicking OK, you will also see that we now have a load case 1 in our browser, which houses the constraints. After defining the constraints, we'll need to define the structural loads or the forces that need to be factored into our design solutions. I'll select structural loads in the toolbar. Let's add some varying forces to the ring components or the middle of this part. I'm going to hide the pin component so it's easier to select the rings. We can then select the inside of both rings. Now it defaults to the angle option, but let's switch this to the vectors option so we can define a load per each axis. For this first structural load, I'm going to type out 8000 in the Z input field. This tells the program it needs to simulate 8000 pounds of force being pushed up in the Z direction when this first load case is run. After clicking OK to confirm our structural load, we'll see that it is added to our load case 1 within the loads folder. Our first load case is all set up and ready to go, but this is where we can really utilize the power of computing and generative design. I'm going to right click on the load case 1 and I'll select clone to create a copy of it. Let's clone this a total of three times so we can set up four different load cases to be tested within our study. At this point, we're ready to define load case number two. I'll double click on it to activate it. Then we can toggle open the loads folder and edit the force. Instead of 8,000 pounds in the Z direction, let's get rid of that and let's try 8,500 pounds in the Y direction. Now we can also add the minus sign in front of the value to flip the direction. I'll make the Y input minus 8,500 before clicking OK. Let's now alter load case number three. I'll double click to activate it, and then I'll edit the force option. For this one, I'll type out negative 7,060 for the Y direction and 6,357 for the Z direction. Notice how the arrows are at an angle because we define two different directions of where the force is being applied. I'll click OK to confirm the force of load case number three. I'll now activate load case number four, and this time I'm going to right click on the force option and I'm going to delete it. For the fourth load case, we're going to apply a different force to each one of these inner rings. I'll activate the Structural Loads feature, and then I'll select the inside of the ring closest to us, or ring number one in the browser. I'll switch this to the vectors as well, and then I'll type out a Y value of negative 1,400. I'll then click OK as we're done defining the first ring. For the second ring, we'll apply the same force, except in the opposite direction. After reactivating the Structural Loads feature, I'll select the inside of the second ring or the ring furthest away from us. I'll then select the Vectors option and I'll type out 1400 for the Y direction, this time making sure not to type out a minus sign. I'll click OK and we're now ready to define our design objectives and manufacturing methods. The next option in the toolbar is our Objectives and Limits. It's here that we can define the objective and safety factor. For this GE part, I'm going to verify that the minimize mass option is selected and that the safety factor is set to the default of two. Now I'll place more info about the safety factor on my website on this tutorial's resource page at productdesignonline.com 28. That's productdesignonline.com 28. Let's now define our manufacturing settings, which ultimately depicts what types of outcomes will be generated. The first option is unrestricted, which means that the study will not account for any specific manufacturing process. This option is hit or miss and depends on the part, but it's interesting to see the options the computer can come up with 
without any restrictions, so we can leave this one checked. We also have the options of additive, milling, two axis cutting, and die casting. For this GE part, let's take a look at what some outcomes could be if we were to 3D print this using an industrial grade 3D printer that prints metal. I'll unselect the milling option and we'll take a look at the additive settings. For the overhang, I'll bump this up to 50 degrees as we'll be working with a printer that can go straight out. For the minimum thickness of the part, I'll switch this to 0.05. Because we only have additive selected, we'll end up with two different types of outcomes, those with additive manufacturing in mind and those without. I'll then click OK as we're done with these manufacturing settings. The last thing that we want to define before we generate all the ideas would be the materials. Now the materials are yet another key consideration that the program will combine with our other rules to come up with the viable solutions. Because we're planning on using a metal 3D printer, we can apply some various types of metal. Activate the study materials feature and you'll see it looks similar to our appearances or physical properties dialog. Let's go ahead and right click on the aluminum material and delete it. We want to explore some different stainless steel options, so I'm going to first make sure that the library is set to the Fusion 360 material library. I'm also going to select the metals folder so I can scroll down and look at the stainless steel options. The first one would be stainless steel AISI 446. To add the materials, we need to drag them up to the top. We don't have to drag them onto the model as we do with physical materials or appearances. Now I'll also find the option Stainless Steel 440C. Steel AISI 1045-390QT. And lastly, let's try a titanium option. I'll drag the titanium 6A1-4V up to the top. For your convenience, I've also placed these materials on this tutorial's resource page so you can reference them. Now that we're done selecting the materials, we can simply close the dialog. At this point, we have all of our rules and guidelines set up to run the study. I'm going to click Save to save a version of this in case Fusion 360 decides to crash as I certainly don't want to have to set everything up again. Then, before clicking Generate, we can use the PreCheck tool, which will let us know if we have anything to be concerned about. As you can see, I'm receiving a warning because one of the bodies is hidden. This is a great reminder that we need to turn the visibility of the pin component back on by selecting its eyeball icon in the browser. If I select the PreCheck tool again, we should get a confirmation that we're all set up. To generate all of the potential design solutions, we need to select the Generate feature. This is where you would typically need to have cloud credits purchased, and it would let you know how many cloud credits are required to run your study. However, if you're watching this before January 1st, 2020, then you'll be able to run as many studies as you would like absolutely free. Again, let me know if you think Autodesk should extend this free period into the new year by commenting yes down below in the comments of this video. While you're at it, hit that like button if you're learning something about generative design. This dialog shows that this would cost 100 cloud credits, but notice that 100 will remain as it's currently free. I'm going to hit Generate One Study to submit the study to the cloud. Now you may get a warning message that thumbnails for the outcomes will start to appear. This is just letting you know that your screen may be blank for a little bit while things begin to process, so we can go ahead and click OK. Notice how we're now placed in the Explore Contextual tab, which hosts a number of features for looking at and refining the results that are generated. The number of results generated depends on how many materials and load cases you set up per each study. This will also affect how long it takes your study to be fully processed. 
Next to study one, you'll see a spinner icon while the job is processing. When the job is completely done, you'll see a check mark icon. For the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to speed past this so you don't have to watch things process. But note that this did take about an hour for everything to process in the cloud. Generative design is very resource intensive, which is why it normally requires cloud credits. Now that all the designs are done processing, we can take a closer look at them. First off, you'll see at the top that we have some sorting options. For example, we could sort this by mass. Then, on the left hand side, I'll drag the mass slider down until about 2.8 pounds. We're then left with only a few options that weigh 2.8 pounds or less. Now the names are truncated, so you'll have to let your mouse rest on the bottom of the thumbnail to see the full name. I'm not going to spend much time covering all the details in this beginner tutorial, but let's select one of the files to take a closer look. As you can see, once you select a design, you can orbit the object in a similar manner to the standard model environment. You can also use the slider at the bottom to flip through the different variations or design solutions. One of the neatest features is the ability to select compare in the toolbar. This allows you to select multiple models to compare with one another. You can also further analyze the designs by looking at the stress view and design space views. Now I want to show you how to export your design, so if you do spend some time playing around with generative design, you're able to 3D print your final outcome. You can simply select Create New Mesh from Outcome to generate a mesh file. Otherwise, if you want to bring the design back into the design workspace to make edits, you can select Create New Design from Outcome. This will take a few minutes to process. However, once you click the Create New Design button, you'll start the process and you'll get notified when the file is ready. In the New Design Ready dialog, click the Open Design option. The design then opens in a new untitled tab where you can make further edits or export the model as an STL file. One of my favorite parts about this process is that the organic shape in the middle is created with T-splines. This means you're able to further edit the design in the form or sculpt environment, which comes in handy if the part is near perfect but needs some minor adjustments. To summarize, generative design is used to create a large number of design solutions that wouldn't be feasible to manually create one by one. After defining the rules and materials for your study, Fusion 360 can create several design solutions, which can then be further defined to help you come up with unique cost-saving designs. Last but not least, I want to give a shout out to all the new patrons and the supporters who have bought me a coffee over the last week. Special thanks to the new patrons, Lars, Herschel Wiggins, Anonymous, Jason, and Heuristic Bishop. Also, thanks to those who supported the channel via my Buy Me A Coffee page, Felipe B., George C., and Jason Cagle. If you have found my tutorials to be helpful in any way, then consider supporting my content by becoming a patron or by making a one-time donation on my Buy Me A Coffee page. All of the contributions help me keep the website up and running and will help me continue to create high quality tutorials, including many more courses that will be released in 2020. As always, I truly appreciate you taking the time to watch this tutorial. Be sure to hit that thumbs up icon if you learned something in this video. Click that Patreon logo right now to be part of the Product Design Online community and to gain access of the tutorial demo files.